So what I'm going to talk about is actually this participation ladder or co-production ladder, because this can really be a very useful toolkit for us to understand how do we make sure that we actually engage meaningfully with experts by experience, with people who are seeking sanctuary. Um, and how do we make sure that our participation is effective with them so that we actually get the most out of our engagement with them. Uh, so this is taken from an organization called Think Local, Act Local, I think around, yeah, probably uh, similar to what I said. Uh, it, it might not be the exact phrase, uh, but also this is taken from a seminal work like from 1969 about citizen control, how government can provide you know, citizen control. But, I mean, there are many different versions of participation ladders or categories. It is just useful for us to um, actually, you know, think about the ways and the categories. Uh, so if you look at this ladder, let's start from the bottom. You can see that coercion and educating is at the bottom of the participation ladder. And this is more methods of participation where you are actually doing something to people. You are trying to fix people. And people are often passive recipients of a service when you are doing these kind of activities. So coercion would be really kind of incentivizing or disincentivizing people to do some activity, to take a service. Educating would be more about telling people about the services and designs about them so that they know about the services, but that's it. There is no engagement, no kind of feedback mechanisms with them. So if you go, upper in the ladder, you will see informing, consultation, and engagement, which are categorized as doing something for people. Uh, so you are engaging and involving people, uh, but it is, not, it, it is not a full, a meaningful engagement. It can be a tokenistic engagement as well. So you would think, for example, informing would be giving information to a service user about a service. But you're not telling them, you're not inviting them to, you know, to develop that service or influence that service. You're just letting them know maybe how you develop that service and that's it. Uh, there's not much engagement. When it comes to consultation, you get a bit of engaging with people. Maybe you send surveys to them, uh, online surveys, or you, you just get their views in some, in some way or another. Uh, but again, you have the control over the design and the delivery of the uh, service. People still, they share their views, but they might not have an active voice in the delivery of the service. When, it, when you come to engagement, it, it can be a bit more engaging with people, maybe not a survey, but a focus group, or maybe you give uh, some, some scope of influencing into a service or a, or, or a program, uh, but you still have the power to decide whether you are going to go with that recommendation or another. So it's a bit more engaging. Uh, this can all be tokenistic, really. You might be doing these activities for the sake of just doing it, for the sake of just you know involving with expert experience, uh, or because of the environment that you have done this. If you, even though you are you have positive intention to engage with people, the methods might not be suitable to get the best insight from people in these methods. Um, so when you go up the upper stages of the ladder, you will see co-design and co-production. Um, this is where we actually see you are doing something with people, uh, not for them, not to them, but with people. So you are on board with the same, you are in the same boat with them, simply. You are in an equal and reciprocal partnership. So this is where you actually kind of blur the lines of service provider and service user. So who is a service user and who is a service provider? You can't actually see in this kind of engagement, which is the best kind of meaningful engagement. So in core design, for example, you involve people in designing a project, an activity, a media piece, I don't know, whatever the activity that you are doing, uh, but you still do not let them see how it went through, you know, the, in the delivery part, the results of it. But when you come to co-production, it includes co-design and also co-delivery and seeing all the results. That's where we actually see, you know, designing and delivering the system together with people who are providing the service. So we, we should always try to achieve co-production and in, 
as a as a principle how how do we make sure that we are in an equal partnership when we are working with sanctuary seekers for example in an activity in a service delivery but having said that we need to think about obviously capacity and how do we make sure you know co-production is really not something to do overnight it's it, it builds on trust relationship it builds on establishing some processes in place uh, so it is okay for us to do some surveys in some you know to, to get some views it's also okay if we kind of do some engagement with people uh, if we don't have enough capacity that's also okay it doesn't mean that you know these are all bad methods and co-production is the best this is just a ladder and this is just like really subjective ways of understanding how do we make sure we engage with people and just to understand how we actually go uh, making our engagement better with them so again if you want to do a survey that's completely okay you know in your local area when you want to understand something or if you want to co-design but we need to kind of always think about you know the ways in which the activity can be also useful for people with lived experience in that activity um so how do we make sure we find resources to ensure there is a co-production on that so i hope this is clear but i can take any questions at this point before we actually go and do some small case studies around these letters. David, I think you have your thumbs up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, obviously, I, I kind of believe fundamentally in this in this sort of principle. And, and when we were working on the nation of sanctuary, we talked about this quite a lot. Whether we were completely successful is another matter, but the, you know, there have been workshops, as you know, held around Wales. Uh, but I've done other jobs. Um, I just thank thank you for mentioning the word surveys because the weakness that you have to be aware of is that the people who want to do co-production are rarely representative. Um, so there's a you know that they can be really helpful, particularly when you come to specific things. But I do think that that people need to think about you know the wider issue of evidence. Some evidence you can get um actually sort of almost statistically um and uh so it goes on and um for me part of the process is is being aware of that evidence and then all the parties involved in co-production uh need to then be aware of that evidence that it's not just their experience uh, in the room uh, but taking account of the wider experience that sometimes you can't, I mean, just an obvious one being language, uh, you know, unless we're fluent in multiple languages, um, you know, I imagine co-production is, is a lot easier um, if it's if it's one language or, you know, in a firm job, I was involved in something that spread throughout Europe was, was worth tens of billions of pounds. Uh, and, you know, there are loads of people with views. So, um, and, and they only knew each of them a lot about a little detail so you know sometimes you've got to play in um evidence to make sure everybody's starting from the same point thanks david um i know yeah we've been exchanged before in wales about this but yeah de definitely i completely agree it, evidence really matters in you know in developing your services or a campaign without evidence you wouldn't do anything and yeah the, you need to be strategic about actually Sometimes in, in some occasions, if you are building a campaign, uh, sometimes you know bringing the voices of people who have lived experience might not be the best way. Maybe actually bringing a large data set of, okay, this is the amount of people in asylum accommodation who don't have access to education, for example, who don't have access to healthcare. Like that evidence might be better used for that policy campaign action. So yeah, completely agree. It's, it's, I think it's just kind of way of showing that. We need to value people's contribution. Huh? And the best way to do that is co-production. But also we need to be kind of striking a balance about our um, activities, outputs that we want to see. So if it is uh, a specific campaign with a very short time, time frame, you need to deliver something, a consultation paper, for example, in six weeks time, um, as in the new immigration plan. Like, do, do you really still have a resource to do a co-production session or would you like to do a survey so we need to kind of 
pick that opportunity and deliver a consultation within that six weeks time, although shameful, that's you know very limited time. So maybe rather than doing a co-production and workshop, maybe we can actually do some surveys to get some views quickly and deliver that. But we still consider about how do we report back to people, you know, those who filled in the survey, maybe updating them regularly about, okay, this is what you've sent to us in your survey, and this is the response from the government. Have you heard they've actually covered this aspect? Or, you know, have you seen the bill? Now, actually, you talked about this uh, temporary protection status, for example. Have you seen that this is the actual result happening? So it's like following up with people, even with surveys, you can do meaningful engagement with people. Um, so thanks, David. I think it's a very kind of good angle to think about it. It's not to demonize uh, some methods of me mechanisms of participation, but it's actually really thinking through how do we make sure we involve people in all of the activities here. So I'm just gonna start the quiz. So hopefully you will see the questions on your phone or your laptop. Uh, just pick the answer that you think is most relevant. Uh, oh, before we do that, actually, Catherine, you have your hands up. Um, yes. Um, the way I see it, and thank you, thank you, David, because I agreed with everything that you said. Um, obviously, involvement and making sure that um, decisions are not made in isolation is really important, and particularly when you're, you're developing a new service or you're, you're making there, there are various things that are really essential for this, you know, for some kind of participation is what it used to be called <laughs> in my day when I was doing this stuff. Um, and that's about, it's about the decision-making and making sure that everyone involved in decision-making, whether it's in designing or, or providing a service, is, is able to contribute in the same way. So therefore, a lot of the things that are in the ladder should apply to all decision-makers. And it shouldn't just apply to those who happen to have lived experience. So it's about truly working together um, and, and not just accepting, say, into a board meeting, a number of people who have lived experience, because nobody can actually represent every, a, a group of people. Everybody, it's whether you want to be a decision maker or not. And there are many people who wouldn't want to be in that position, but want to be able to influence decision. And there's, so there's various levels of both co-design and co-production in that sense, because you could be doing, um, I mean, locally, we have a very good co-pro setup. And there are people who are looking at, say, where should toilets be in the local hospital? Something as simple as that. There are other people who may be co-proing with the hospital board, and that's the same for all organisations. But it, it, it's about who wants to be involved at what sort of level as well. And certainly, definitely, and I'm just saying this, don't ignore all the things underneath, because that's what really informs the decision for the decision makers. You might put it anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine, for, for, for the intervention. Yeah, I mean, really useful. Uh, yeah, decision making can take place in different ways, really. And it's about actually really thinking through and striking that balance about, you know, how, what decisions you are making and if the people are representative enough to make those decisions. As you say, many people might think that, OK, I'm engaging with this activity representing the migrant community. You might not, you, you, you can represent yourself, but some people would say that, you know, I'm actually representing, but from my lived experience, that's okay. But some people might think that, no, actually I'm a community champion. I've worked with many people. I would like to bring all the things together. Uh, so there are various ways of, you know, engagement uh, and understanding. Obviously it, it will depend on uh, people who want to be involved, obviously. You can't force people to do co-production. If they want to be, you know, just fill in the survey, that's also okay. So there is really kind of a broad spectrum of things that we can do. It's just about like thinking, thinking people, putting people first before we do activity. Um, maybe checking with them actually what they, what, what they want to see as the output of that or what they want to see out of this engagement. That's always better rather than deciding on behalf of them, okay, this is the engagement and this is the voucher you are gonna get. Maybe, you know, checking with them, maybe they, they want networking, they want something else. Um, I mean, I could 
we, we could speak more and more, I think. Catherine, is that a new hand to follow up or is that a legacy hand? Yusuf, I'm mindful that we want to make sure we hear from Imam and Dr. Epsiam. So if we... Uh... Yeah, so should we move on to do maybe one or two quiz questions and then to, uh, to you, Shan. Okay, so I've started the quiz. Yeah, I'm gonna start it now. Actually, I can see 18 people in the quiz now, which is great. Uh, you can still see the instructions here. Uh, if you haven't started joined, uh, you can still join it. So you will see the questions now. Don't worry about points about anything. It's just, yeah, just to think about this ladder. So a local charity provides housing to people seeking asylum. And the charity seeks feedback from service users by running mystery shopping activities. So which of these methods do you think this would apply to? Is it a co-production, consultation, or engagement? Yeah, we have five consultation, five engagement. Again, it doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong answer, but we can say at this point, a mystery shopping activity, a kind of getting feedback is consultation uh, where people do not have a lot of impact on the decisions. So you, you, you have the right to actually, you have the power to actually whether to go for a recommendation in a mystery shopping feedback or not. Engagement would, would have been more where you actually put more power to people who are who you are engaging with to see if they can change some of the decisions. Uh, again, this is just to stimulate thinking. So no worries uh, for those who said engagement, but they are all in the same category of actually doing two, do, doing four people. Uh, perfect. Well, let's go to the next question and to see the example. An organization who provides destitution service noticed a rise in a rise in demand for cash support and sets up a debt advice service and notifies service users. So do you think this activity is an education, informing, or coercion? Yeah, most people said it's informing. It's just notification. You don't actually tell them about anything about design. You might talk about, oh, we've actually seen a rise and then we developed this service and that's it really. So they just know about the service and how that service came about. Nothing more about that. Perfect. The next question, oh, we have a leaderboard actually at this point, but we can just quickly pass this. So we can see, yeah, five people who did both questions correct. Uh, let's go to the third question now. A research team on migrant health recruits migrants with health conditions to conduct research, to reach out to other migrants, to analyze the data, and to co-author the report as a, at the end of that project. So do you think this is a co-design, co-production, or consultation? Sorry if the time is not enough to read and absorb. <laughs> But yeah, so this is uh, for people said co-production. As you can see, for example, you're actually recruiting people, uh, migrants into your research team. So there is really a blur between who is actually the research team and who is migrants. And you are actually also co-authoring the report with them. So they, they have their names in the report. So this is where actually we can see it's a real co-production. They, uh, you know, there is no service user or service provider. Uh, but there is also value-driven approach. You know, everyone is that equal and there is a report recognizing everyone's involvement in that report. Uh, last question on this to see how it goes. So a new refugee integration loan service requires new refugees to do voluntary work for three weeks while looking for jobs to be eligible for the loan that they are providing. Do you think this is coercion, educating, or engagement. Yep, there are some engagement and educating parts, but it is because it's it has a requirement. You know, the service provides people to do voluntary work, even though it's voluntary, but it's a requirement to be eligible for a loan. It's kind of you are providing an incentive or disincentive to make people to do something to get some service. So it is more in the lines of coercion rather than educating and engagement. 
Uh, you can think about you know other ways as well. It, it is educating maybe to to get for job or something. But the way the mechanism works is here is is, is pretty much coercion. Uh, so let's look at the leaderboard who did all questions correct or okay. So I perfect. So Rachel and Harriet, well done for getting all questions correct. Again, it's not a, a big thing, but just to kind of think about it. And it's followed by Sean, Puffy, Metal, Johnny, Twito, Agent X9, and Will, and Roland. So the next slide is just an open-ended comment section. Uh, so it is going to be on your forum, on your mechanism. So I'm going to leave the space to Sean now. But during the session, if you have any ideas, any comments that are coming up, you can just use Zoom chat or you can use this meetmenti.com so we can see all the um, comments here. Over to you, Sean. Hopefully you can see this. Um, so this was co-designed or um, mainly designed by Armani, our, our co uh, chair, but unfortunately she wasn't able to make this session, so you're stuck with me, but if you want to hear more from Amani, she's on the recording for our network voice session. Um, hang on a sec, I can't, how, how do I share the uh, slideshow? Okay, so I'll be really quick, because I think we'd, we'd love to hear from Imam and what they had been doing in Calderdale. But what we've been doing as an organization. We've been running the Sanctuary in Politics and, and Imam is one of our fantastic graduates. Um, so she wanted to talk a little bit more about the course she can. Um, but uh, there's a couple of people on the call as well that I think have attended. But the aim, the aim of this course is to empower people with lived experience to become leaders in the organization, in our networks and in our wider movement and to create change in their own communities and further afield. So there's lots of information on our website so you can read more about the Sanctuary and Politics course and some of you have been engaged in that. And um, so quickly, I think that has produced amazing results for the organization in terms of supporting people to become leaders. I'm pressing the arrow and it's not going. Yep. Okay, so um, what we've also done to increase participation and engagement, we've built co-production within all of our strategic objectives. We established our experts by experience operational advisory group. So um, Lorraine is on, on the call here. So is Shams. And um, basically they can, uh, look at any aspect of, our, uh, of the organization's operations and influence the directions and plans. A good example of that was our Connect and Create project and the, the school homeworking. So that came directly from our group. The homeschooling support that we put on during the pandemic came um, via Shams who was saying within his communities, lots of people were really struggling to support the children with, this, with their homework. And we now have four people with lived experience on our board and we ensure that people with lived experience are involved in all the planning of events and on the streams steering groups and particularly ensuring that people are involved in awards our recruitment procedures so we've definitely improved the way we recruit and we now pay for an outside independent consultant to support people with lived experience to make an application and if successful then shortlisted they're supported during the preparation for interviews and as a result of kind of ensuring a couple of years ago that we uh, put together a plan to make sure we improved uh, the empowerment of people with lived experience we've now developed a sanctuary ambassador network they're all extremely um involved in all aspects of city of sanctuary which is great because we get that wider perspective at a local level as well as at a national level and we've got a dedicated person megan supporting uh, the ambassadors and working with them on improving communications and engagement we've got a long way to go but i think we've definitely improved and particularly around our communication work to raise the voices of people seeking sanctuary. So very quick whistle stop tour of just kind of the key things that we're doing. But I really like to yeah invite him and hear more 
about what they've been doing in Calder Day. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, to, uh, thank you so much, Shan, for introducing me. And I, indeed, I, was, uh, I joined the course of uh, Sanctuary in Politics that was in September 2019. And that, I think that was the starting point to, um, like to tell me and spark me just to do something to, into the community and to be involved more, meaningfully involving really with the community and um, in, the, in the process of decision making, especially with the organizations providing the service uh, for people, pe people seeking sanctuary anyway. Then I joined the Calderdale Valley of Sanctuary as development worker. So uh, we, the, I, I was trying to inspire them to do it more in a in, in more creative way as you are presenting yourself like co-protection, uh, co-designing. But at the end, we need the, the ownership of the project as well. We need to create that kind of ownership. If the people feels that they get the, they, they got the feeling of the ownership, they, they, the sustainability will, will be going for, 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 uh, for, for long. So yeah, so what we, what we was trying to do is like to develop a survey for those people who are not represented on the organizations and those people who are left behind and their voices are not being heard. We want to get as many voices as we could. So we developed a survey on the need of people seeking sanctuary. And then we got certain questions and we were asked, but it was really tricky because we got lots of barriers and difficulties like the language, like different culture as well to understand what are the terminologies and what, what, do, what do they mean? And some, some people, if they, I tell them to participate so what participations mean to them and so most of the people even they do not know the terms expert by experience so it's really hard to engage people or meaningfully co-protect something with them and they lack they lack the language itself how to do it and but anyway lots of difficulties but lots of opportunities on the same sides but let me also tell you what are the difficulties as well because people who are with disability we couldn't reach them i remember i came across someone who's deaf i couldn't speak the sign language really and those pe and young people as well who are not represented, who are represented by, by the voice of the adults, of their parents. So we should really m m c think about them more. Uh, uh, and the opportunities is that we get more people to interact with us, more people to um, who wants to do voluntary work, who who wants to uh, to use their 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 experience. Anyway, we try to develop a kind of a strategy for Calder Dale Valley of Sanctuary, and then we're gonna present it on the twenty seventh. Uh, with other organizations and we're going to create a kind of partnership how to do it how to how to create a kind of starting point uh, how, who is going to monitor it and how to involve people on all the stages starting from the decision making strategic level operational level and also administrative level and all the levels of the organizations not only the organizations and make, we make we make sure they're also connected to the community to the public service to other other organizations as well so i'm trying to be really brave but lots of of lessons learned lots of things so if you are re really interested to, to 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 hear about it more come to our sessions on the 27th i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna give you the zoom link for that event yeah thanks Iman. can we hear from dr Ittisan now um, hi can you can you hear me right yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, can I use uh, uh, can I use the slides? I've got two, three slides, right? Yeah, uh, you should have the ability to share your screen. Share my screen. Can you see it now? Yeah. Um. Yeah. My name is Ipti Sam. I'm based in Sheffield. I've been living in Sheffield since two thousand and five. I was saying. I want to move from Sheffield, but it looks like I'm very happy here. Uh, this is a really good community here in Sheffield. Um, I, I become involved in um, expert rights experience, actually, when the when I uh, started invited by City of Century Sheffield to do some voluntary work for them uh, during the, uh, the first lockdown um, and then uh, start working with them since that time. And because I'm a lived experience person as well, so it was like really good contribution to uh, contact others who need support and service. 
and then being invited by action, uh, Rotigio Action to uh, be nominated and, and joined a uh, training uh, run by uh, Rotigio Actions to uh, see how we can actually come with this uh, experts by experience uh, group, what we call a team actually. Uh, and then uh, the May, June, uh, we attended, uh, including Yusuf was one of um, uh, the members there. We attended the training uh, and then in uh, August, we start between us in Sheffield, we start creating the needed and, and um, required documents to actually go for it because after attending the training, it was like it's really useful to go for it. And we started actually working very hard to create all the documents, including terms of reference, which is actually outlined everything about what we should do and who we are and the, the relationship between the team with other components within the city of Central Sheffield. So it was really hard work, to be honest, to try to design this relationship. And then by uh, September, uh, the first uh, uh, September, we created Leflet and we start promoting the team within our volunteers and we start recruiting uh, members from there. Uh, it took a bit of time for others to understand it. Then I uh, designed workshop to an uh, informative uh, workshop or induction workshop to actually let the who's uh, uh, interested to join us what's really all this about because it was something new uh, and that was really good as well. I actually um, delivered that workshop twice. Um, recently, I, we started our work. So we've got, we already recruited volunteers. We started our first session, which is we call the uh, Experience Bank uh, session, which is involving um, identifying the team, trying to see what's the team, uh, what the team think about this uh, team, what are we going to do and that relationship. But it was like talking about our own experience and what are we going, going to actually contribute to uh, the city of Century. And uh, next Friday, we're going to run another next uh, workshop. But the thing is about this is why we, this is the main question, why do we really need um, this team? Uh, so this is actually basically is uh, to be a space, actually a safe space, if you like, uh, or a respected space uh, for, uh, for uh, the volunteers or lived experience people to have a within the city of century um, structure. And that was a really tricky one because we know the city of Central Shafi, they've got their own uh, trustees, they've got their own project and uh, many components of project within the, within the same organization. So we were really working very hard to see where we're gonna go there. So where we're gonna be. So that was really, really difficult. And uh, we, we managed to come with this. Actually, we are there to um, not to monitor anyone, not to observe, you know, anyone's work, not to this, just be there to uh, make, to um, like having the space to share our views, our experience as lived experience people. So, and then we come with this, um, uh, with this uh, 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 structure, if you can see it. So this is where you can see ourselves, it's here. So you can see there. So this is this is the structure of the organization. Actually, uh, we've got the trustees and we've got director staff and us. And this is actually how it works. So this is the volunteers uh, staff uh, uh, team, and then you've got us here and you've got the trustees. So and then we decided, okay, what, how the relationship is gonna be because it looks like it, it needs to be really carefully designed. And we don't want to actually uh, supervise or, as I said, like uh, observe anyone. It just be here to, to support everybody here. So the relationship between us and the trustees, for example, we actually decide, decided to have two uh, representation, representative from the team to attend the, month, the meeting, the trustees meeting. And that's how we can see how we're gonna work with them and, and check their policies and anything and then we decided we're going to work with the uh, volunteer coordinator here if we need any volunteers. And we don't want actually any conflicts between the volunteers and, and any other stuff here if they want to come directly to the team uh, complaining or, or whatever uh, reporting. So we decided to have very clear relationship with the volunteer coordinator. 
as well as a director here. So that this is the main structure actually for, for uh, us. And this is where we can see ourselves going to work very well. And we decided as well to have representer as well uh, within the uh, recruitment team, uh, recruit the City of Century Shepherd recruitment. So again, to uh, help there and to design or to, to, to uh, attend the interviews. Uh, so that's, that's, that's really the membership is actually we decide is lived experience people who see who, who um, see consensually and we started we now started with the six members and we're going to extend it to 10 but after we set all the, 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 the foundation for, for the group actually well actually this is it thank you very much that was fantastic thanks to both of you for sharing your expertise we're really appreciative so we've got five minutes for questions now. David, did you turn off? Yeah, well, if there's nobody else. Um, oh, Will has got his hand up, but David, you go first and then Will. Yeah, it's sort of how this applies to sort of smaller groups in particular. It seems that it's it's quite helpful and important to have a group of people who've been trained and are working together and feel safe as described but then that obviously creates a potentially a barrier between that and everybody else um and or uh, you know you've got to have a lot of um capacity to do that equally if you bring somebody directly onto your group that's a huge challenge you know they may not have heard about you don't have to be totally British about how you do it, but inevitably there's a bit of a an issue there, and, and therefore it's very hard for them to feel to feel part of things. So you know there's a really tricky balance, and if you're starting from a, a low level, which sadly we are um, uh, in in Cardiff specifically, there's lots of really active and great people with lived experience, but. And getting them involved in a little group is uh, there are there are one or two. There's one coming to the event today, but you know it's quite a challenge. So how do you get that balance, and how does this work for for smaller groups? How do you get started? Well, Iman's from a smaller group. Um... As you said, yes, it's very challenging, very challenging to get this group to participate and to engage and to continue this kind of engagement through the process if we have really a continuous process, not like for short, uh, short, uh, short period. Uh, sometimes they need incentive, you, might, you need to give them incentives. Uh, to be honest, the, one of the things that uh, has been found by my survey is that they look also for financial, uh, financial uh, incentive because they should be appreciated, they should be acknowledged for their contributions as well in a way because they got limited resources from the home office especially the asylum asylum seekers as well so in a way also some, sometimes we need to give them data to to give them the, the data voucher and in, in a way sometimes and other people it depends on the personality of the people they're looking for um, educa education training something you need to study each in, in individual in, individual need for each person in order to know what incentive or or, yeah, incentive that keeps that person. So you need also to look at the talented people if you're providing the service who are really the potential one to be a leader or to step out and take a role in the community. So it is, it's not only one solution. It's like many things, my, many tricks you need to apply. I think David says a lot about relationship building as well as a starting point. Um, so Will? Thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, that's been really helpful, both the last, particularly the last two presentations. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we, at last, we're making some encouraging progress in Bradford. We're, we're sort of a bit further down, the, well, not nearly as far down the road as Sheffield, but definitely on a similar course. Two challenges, really, for us, the long-term challenge is that we're not a service-providing group. Some of us are involved in groups that do provide services, you know, some of us on, on the board, but we don't have the direct contact with service users. So actually to try and reach people with lived experience who understand what an earth city of sanctuary is about has been quite a challenge. You know, we, it, it's, I'd struggle myself to explain to people for whom English is a first language. Uh, 
but the other particular challenge over unsurprisingly over the last 18 months is accessing reaching anybody at all because all the frontline services where we would normally be able to talk to people or, or in least first or second hand have been closed and you know this is obviously part of a far bigger problem but you know we're finding across the sector that it's 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 more and more difficult to reach people in the dispersed accommodation uh, or indeed anywhere because they're not accessing the services so there's a far bigger wider more more significant issue of people isolated and and um you know and, and cut off uh, but for our point of view it's been really quite difficult to try and actually reach you know let, let alone explain what on earth we're about to people so I, i'm sure everybody will be or most people are having that the latter challenge so that's more of a statement than a, a question sorry <laughs> thanks thanks well just to say we will be running our sanctioning politics course online so if you do have anyone who's involved in your group as a new step um, they'll be able to join that course so they'll learn a lot but also they'll have a really good understanding by the end of the course about what it is actually is and what we do.